left a note for me up here as an example of wisdom. It says, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, and wisdom is knowing not to place a tomato in a fruit salad. So uh, I, I really don't know if much more needs to be said, <laughs> said than that. All right, uh, we're, we're going to turn our attention now to the book of Job. Undoubtedly a familiar book uh, to many of you, that when we come to the book of Job, we come to what is unquestionably a masterpiece of literature. The great 19th century English poet, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, declared Job to be, quote, the greatest poem of ancient or modern times. Uh, French poet, playwright Paul Claudel said that, quote, of all the books in the Old Testament, Job is the most sublime, the most poignant, the most bold, the most enigmatic, the most deceptive, and the most shocking. In terms of mere literary merit, the book of Job is rightly considered on par with the works of the great classics. Think of Homer, Shakespeare, Milton, Dante, and the poet of Job, whoever he or she was. Uh, they evidence remarkable literary skill. However, more than just a literary masterpiece, the book of Job is equally well regarded as a theological masterpiece. Perhaps the greatest living commentator on the book of Job, David Kleins, has called Job, quote, the th most theologically and intellectually intense book of the Old Testament. Job is a powerful book. It's a passionate book. It's a mysterious book. And it's an incredibly challenging book. Now, those of you who have studied Hebrew know that Job is the most difficult Hebrew in the entire uh, Bible. But at the end of the day, Job was not written to bewilder Hebrew students, right? It was not written to confuse, but it was written to minister. It was written to minister to those who suffer and to those who find themselves disoriented and who are attacked or accused. Now, the book of Job is rightly regarded as wisdom literature, and its goal is to, in its own unique way, to instill wisdom for life, to offer guidance or skill for living. Uh, Klein, who I mentioned before, wrote that no one is able to say what Job is all about. Uh, and this is from someone whose final volume of his commentary on Job landed at just over 1,600 pages. And so I want to resist the temptation of, of suggesting to you that I know what Job is all about. I just want to tell you something that Job is about. And I want to enter the book of Job uh, with a question. It's a question that is asked in the book of Job in the famous hymn in chapter 28. And the question is this, where shall wisdom be found? Where shall wisdom be found? Job 28 verse 12 he says, where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? I'll go ahead and give you the answer up front in case you need to leave early. And the answer is God. Wisdom is found in God. It's simple. It's a profound, profound truth that ministers to Job and can minister to us in deep, poignant, important ways. Ultimately, wisdom and understanding of how the world works, why things happen in the world, this rests in God alone. Job is moved, you see, from the, the pits of the darkest despair to hope through an encounter with God in which this central truth of Scripture is proclaimed that wisdom resides in God. Job 28, 23 says, God understands the way to wisdom and knows its place. For he looks to the end of the earth and he sees everything under heaven. Uh, now, th this may sound patently obvious to most of us at a Reformed conference on the, you know, theology, uh, but the book of Job is also interested in pressing home the implications of saying that wisdom is found in God. The main implication being that no human being has full access complete access to the wisdom of God, that there is much knowledge and much understanding that is inaccessible to us as creatures. And the remarkable truth 
that is proclaimed in the book of Job is that there's comfort to be found in this. There's comfort here. There's a certain paradox to human existence. But as G.K. Chesterton says, that the lesson of the whole work is that man is comforted by paradox. And so I want to consider wisdom in Job, and I want to consider it by by looking at how it's found in the three principal actors, you may say. First, looking at at Job's friends, and second, Job himself, and then third, third, God. So first, consider the wisdom of Job's friends. At the end of chapter two, when Job's three friends appear on the scene, a, a, a lot has taken place. These three friends have entered unwittingly onto the stage of a much larger drama. It's a cosmic contest between God and Satan. In just two chapters, we've learned a great deal. We've been introduced to the man, of, the man Job, and Job, you'll remember, is exemplary for his godliness. Uh, three times in just two chapters, once by the narrator, twice by God, we're told that, quote, Job is blameless and upright, one who fears God and turns away from evil. This is not suggesting that Job was sinless. But it does tell us that Job was godly, possibly the most godly man on the planet. And we also learn that Job enjoyed remarkable blessings. He has a wife. He has 10 children, thousands of sheep, camels, hundreds of oxen and donkey. He enjoys life marked in every way by the external blessing of God. And it's in these first two chapters as well that we learn about the heavenly contest between God and Satan. Satan, whose name means literally the accuser, he puts this question to God. He says, does Job fear God for no reason? Satan's question, you see, is that Job's piety is motivated by self-interests. It's because he's enjoying the Lord's blessing that Job is at trusting you, God. This is an assault on God's integrity. And God enters in. God doesn't have to enter in, but he does enter in. God allows, in effect, his integrity to be put on trial. And this is critical for understanding the book of Job. The question at issue throughout the book is not, has Job sinned? I think it can be misunderstood in that way sometimes. The question is not, has Job sinned? The question is whether Job is innocent of an offense for which his suffering is a punishment. And we're told at the beginning that he is not, or that that he is. His suffering is not a result of a particular sin in his life. God has a purpose in Job's suffering, but whatever that purpose is, we can know at the outset that it's not punitive. Job's wealth, Job's family at this point are made fair game. You know the story. Satan destroys it all in an instant. And how does Job respond? Job 120, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked, I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, we're told, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Satan then doubles down and suggests that, well, what Job values most is his life, his health, and that if his own health comes to ruin, then he'll curse God to his face, and Job is delivered into Satan's hand. He's struck down with sores over his entire body. He's left sitting in an ash heap, scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery, and his wife speaks first. She says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he says to her, you speak as one of the foolish wisdom speaks. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not also receive evil? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. And so Job is left in complete darkness. He has no idea why this tragedy has befallen him and there's no end in sight. And it's into this context that the three friends come. At first, they sit with him in silence 
for seven days and seven nights. In hindsight, this was the best thing they did. Job speaks out then in chapter three with the most gut-wrenching cry of uh, dereliction and forsakenness in scripture, second only to the cry of our own savior on the cross. He cries out, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said, a man is conceived. Job curses the day of his birth. He longs for the day of his death. And as Job is cursing the day of his birth, he's cursing the light in his eyes. He's cursing the breath in his lungs. He seems to be on the the brink of cursing God himself. And as we, we read, the tension is sort of mounting. Is Job going to do it? Is Satan going to win? Is he going to curse God and die? But he never does. Victory. Well, not yet. And then, unwittingly, spokesmen for Satan, the three friends, speak up. They consider uh, Eliphaz, the first friend, in chapter 4, verse 7. What does he say? He says, remember, who was it that was innocent ever perished? Where were the upright ever cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Do you see what he's saying there? He's saying that those who reap iniquity and trouble do so because they've sown iniquity and trouble. You reap what you sow. You can see Eliphaz's reasoning here, can't you? Job, the only explanation for all this trouble is that you've sinned and you've sinned grievously. This is how the world works, Job. Consider Bildad. Bildad reasons much the same way. Uh, Job 8.11 says, can papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there is no water? This is the ancient equivalent to the proverb, where there is smoke, there's fire. He says in 8.4, if your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. It's the same reasoning with a third friend, Zophar. All three of the friends have basically the same theology. They express it in different ways, but at its core, the wisdom of these three friends is the doctrine of retribution. You reap what you sow. And Job must have sown a great sin to be reaping such a great suffering. It's striking, I think, that Satan in the garden, like Satan in the garden, the three friends do not speak blatant lies. They speak rather deceptive words, words that are recognizably true, but words, I would even say that many of which, if you found them in the book of Proverbs, you would consider how these nuggets of wisdom are true to human experience. Nevertheless, words which are at heart deceptive. In Job 8.20, Bildad says, behold, God will not reject the blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. The wisdom of the three friends is recognizably proverbial. It's at home in Israel's wisdom tradition. It affirms God as the sovereign creator of the universe. It affirms an order to creation. It affirms perhaps perhaps above all else, the doctrine of retribution, that our, our deeds, our actions have consequences. A wise and upright life leads to prosperity and blessing, And a wicked and crooked life leads to suffering and death. But at the end of the day, what the three friends are speaking are lies. Job's three friends think that they are speaking for God, that they are defending God, but they are, in fact, representatives of Satan. They have examined Job's circumstances, and they've come to the conclusion that his suffering can only be the consequence of a great sin. You know, John Calvin preached 159 sermons on the book of Job. And he said about the three friends, some comforters have but one song to sing, and they have no regard to whom they sing it. The doctrine of retribution is true, but it's not the whole truth. It's not the only truth. 
And the, Job's three friends have made the doctrine of retribution the only truth. Uh, Derek Thomas has summarized the point at issue here helpfully when he said that a half-truth told as a whole truth becomes an untruth. There is genuine wisdom in the friends, but they don't see the whole picture. And in their arrogance, they believe that they, ha- they have God all figured out. There's no mystery left for the friends. Nothing about God or his ways in the world that they don't understand. Nothing that they can't explain with all of their rigid and unbending wisdom. And what I think we see, therefore, in Job's friends is the awful consequences of wisdom misapplied. As we saw just earlier, the Proverbs have have a word for such a person. What do the Proverbs call someone who misapplies wisdom? A fool. A fool. There's a temptation you see in wisdom. It's a temptation to think that because we know some things, that therefore we know everything. It's a temptation to think that because we know how the world often works, therefore we know how the world always works. And that in gaining a degree of wisdom, we have therefore plumbed the depths of the mind of God and that we can explain why everything is happening in the world. And like Job's friends, I think this often comes out in our uh, churches, our communities, and our culture at times of crisis. Uh, Perhaps some of you noticed that on the heels of almost any natural disaster, whether it's a terror attack or an earthquake or or some sort of crisis, there will inevitably be someone who's going to show up on a, a news network and tell us exactly what God is up to in bringing about such a tragedy. Uh, just uh, a few years ago, I think it was, the prominent evangelical pastor speaking at a prominent evangelical college told the student body that 9-11 was God's punishment on America for banning public prayers, legalizing abortion, and striking down laws against sodomy. How many Christians have been deeply wounded by well-meaning but foolish brothers or sisters trying to explain why they suffered this loss, right? Why they are enduring this sickness or experiencing this tragedy. God is trying to teach you this. He's trying to get you to to grow in this way. The book of Job challenges us. It challenges us neither to not accept nor to propound such simplistic answers to the great mysteries of life, like the great mystery of God's purposes in human suffering. But that's the wisdom of Job's three friends. It's pseudo-wisdom that in reality makes them fools. But what about the wisdom of Job? At the end of the book, Job is vindicated. That's critical. I think that's central for interpretation. Job 42, 7, we read, After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Job is said to have spoken rightly. Now, how has Job spoken rightly? This was really the narrative tension throughout. This is the heart of the heavenly contest. Will Job's curse God? Will, God? will Job reject God? This was the temptation of Job's wife, that Job would curse God and die. And so what does Yahweh mean when he says, Job has spoken of me what is right? Much of what Job says borders on blasphemy. And if any one of you were to say this in a public setting, you'd probably get a visit from your elders. Job is raging against heaven. But Job's speech at the end of the day is regarded as right. And it's regarded as right, I believe, because it's, what God is referring to is Job's persistence in faith. Job continues to believe that throughout his ordeal, throughout all of his doubt, Throughout all of his despair, throughout all of his confusion and anger and frustration and his rage, he persists in faith. He's still believing. He believes 
God to be a God of justice. And though he believes that God has acted unjustly, nevertheless, he wants an audience with God because God is a God of justice. He perseveres. He perseveres in faith, though he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand God's way. Nevertheless, he trusts God. This is what James, I believe, has in view when he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The Old Testament literature in general, wisdom literature, uses this expression, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. This is the language of faith. Job persisted in the fear of the Lord, despite all of his doubt, anger, frustration, and despair. True wisdom, you see, ultimate wisdom, not exhaustive wisdom, but true wisdom has a firm foundation in reality. And it's a wisdom that is rooted in faith in God as the Lord of creation. It's interesting that almost all of Job's responses to his friends, and you remember how the how the story goes. The friends speak and Job responds to the friends, right? Another friend speaks and Job responds to that friend. And almost all of Job's responses to the friends, we find that they very quickly turn from an address to the friends to an address to God. And you read along and it's a little hard to tell where the transition is, but it's very clear that at the, at the end, he's talking to God. And at the beginning, he's talking to the friend. And you sort of, his mind keeps moving from their accusations to heaven, knowing that ultimately the one with whom he has to do are not these three friends, but God himself. Job says in 13 verse 2, speaking to the friends, he says, what you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue my case with God. But by the end, verse 24, Job is saying, why do you hide your face and count me your enemy? Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to God. Job understands that it's ultimately God who is the one who will justify or condemn. It is to God that he takes his complaint and his case. And Job's faith is, of course, seen most clearly as his complaints and his laments are interrupted with the most heartfelt and poignant expressions of trust and confidence. Job 13, 15, Job says, though he slay me, I will hope in him, yet I will argue my ways to his face. There will be my salvation that the godless shall not come before him. Job is confident. Now, in spite of what he's currently experiencing, he knows God to be a God of justice. And in this, he may have hope. Job 16, 18. O earth, cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven. He who testifies for me is on high. My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. That he would argue my case, the case of a man with God as the son of man does with his neighbor. Job here is longing for a mediator. One to go between him and the almighty. And he knows that if his case gains a hearing, he would find favor with God. But of course, nothing in Job's discourse, perhaps nothing in the entire Old Testament comes close to Job 19.25. And after wishing that his words would be memorialized on stone, written with iron so that they would never wear out, Job says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another. Uh, The 19th century Princeton professor, William Henry Green, uh, said that Job's declaration here is, quote, the crowning victory over Satan's fiercest and most subtle temptation. It is faith planting itself firmly on the unseen, When not one single external ground of support remains, he goes on, he says, the flukes of his anchor have taken hold of the immovable rock of ages. 
The rage of the tempest and the dashing waves and the heaving sea cannot tear his vessel from its moorings. Job's desire for a redeemer here is not so much an atonement for sin. I think we can often read this New Testament categories back into Job's context. What he's longing for is what the, the Old Testament knows as a goel or a kinsman redeemer. One who would represent Job and argue his case in front of his kinsmen. Job's wisdom, therefore, is his perseverance in the fear of the Lord. Faith, which must at times defy experience. Faith, which, which must at times defy reason. Faith, which has nothing to hold on to except God himself. Job's climactic expressions of faith here comes in the, his responses to the divine speeches. Right? You'll remember after Yahweh speaks to Job out of the whirlwind, twice, Job is moved to humility and to submission. Uh, Hal Jones is absolutely correct when he sees Yahweh's summons to Job in, in chapter 38 as a summons to a legal contest. It's a wrestling match of wisdom. Yahweh says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. It's a summons to combat and it has legal overtones. God is going to wrestle with Job, Howell says, as the angel of the Lord did with Jacob. You'll remember how Jacob wrestled with the angel, right, in Genesis 32. How does Jacob triumph in that scene? I think sometimes we, we misunderstand, misconstrue what exactly that wrestling match looked like where Jacob has wrestled the angel and he's clinging on to him and saying, I will not let you go until until you bless me. Oh, when in reality, uh, Jacob had been defeated. Right? He doesn't have the angel in a headlock. He's clinging onto the angel's legs. Right? He's absolutely humiliated. He's defeated. He's humbled. And it's at that moment that Jacob receives the blessing. It's in humility. It's in weakness. Jacob, who all through his life was trying to gain the blessing through cunning and through trickery and deceit and lies, receives it not through cunning, cunning, trickery, deceit, and lies, but through humility and clinging on to the one uh, who promised to bestow this blessing upon him by his grace. So too with Job. Job responds in verse 3 of chapter 40, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once. I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And again in chapter 45, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. Therefore, I recant and relent, being but dust and ashes. Job is humbled. Job submits, though he is never told what lies behind his suffering. Job, nevertheless, is able to take comfort in the majesty and the wisdom of God, who is sovereign over all things, even over the evil that takes place in the world. And so the fear of the Lord is the wisdom of Job. And finally, what is the wisdom of God? Uh, at the conclusion of Job 31, chapter 31, we hear Job resting his case. He makes his concluding remarks. And he declares his own integrity in the most unequivocal of terms. And he calls on God to answer him and to meet him. And we're told in verse 40 that the words of Job are ended. And then Yahweh responds in chapter 38. The Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man and I will question you and you make it known to me. God enters into a contest of wisdom with Job. So far, God has sat in the dock and heard much from Job and his three friends. And now God steps out of the dock and puts questions to Job. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding who determined its measurements. Surely you know. On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
And with this, God begins to unfurl the wonders and the majesty of the universe. He marshals as evidence of his wisdom, the understanding of the seas and the light, the snow and the rain, the stars and the clouds. God speaks of lions and mountain goats, wild donkeys and wild oxen, the ostrich, the horse, the hawk. And all of this, what God is saying to Job is, what do you know about these things? Where were you when they were designed? What wisdom do you express in their governance? And then in Yahweh's second speech, he brings forward two creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan. And these become tests of Job's power. What strength does Job have over these creatures? These creatures are commonly understood as what? The hippopotamus and the crocodile, respectively. As they're described, they're described as these sort of enormous and monstrous creatures. And Yahweh says to Job, can you take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? He says about the Leviathan, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope around his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Here, Yahweh is expressing his own physical power over the created order. Not only the created order, but these two monstrous creatures, many have suggested, and I think rightly so, what we see here are symbols of evil as well. Perhaps you've noticed that Satan never appears again in the book of Job. He doesn't make an entrance at the end. But here, I believe in these two monstrous creatures, the behemoth and the Leviathan. Here we see images of evil, these primordial creatures that would stand opposed to God. Isaiah 27.1 says that in the day of the Lord with his hard and great strong sword, God will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, the Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Here we see God declaring to Job that he is sovereign even over those forces of evil in this world. Yahweh's speeches are powerful. They are mesmerizing. They're bewildering. They're bewildering in part because they never actually address Job's question. Never once does God respond to Job's accusations. Notice that at the end, Job has been told nothing. Sometimes the book of Job is described as the the vindication of God's ways toward man. This, I think, could be misleading, however. God never explains his ways to Job. What God is up to is not in explaining himself to Job. Rather, what God is up to, as William Henry Green again puts it so wonderfully, is that God does not appear here in order to vindicate himself, but to rescue Job. The point of this questioning, this barrage of questions, is not to to explain himself, but to do something to Job, to do something for Job, namely to, to reorient Job to who God is as sovereign and Lord of all. In fact, God's refusal to explain himself, in this we are given a message that God is sovereign, and that much of God's wisdom remains hidden in his inscrutable and mysterious will. The point of Job is that much of God's ways toward man are mysterious. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, again, I think puts it so well when he wrote that the riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of man. The riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of man. The wisdom of God does not give Job the answers he is looking for, but rather it reorients Job to who God is and who Job is in relation to God. This is what Job needed and what God in his wisdom and goodness gives to Job. Job has faith in God, but what Job needed to experience is, quote, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, as Paul puts it, to be able to express how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor. Now, what do we make of the conclusion of Job? 
after all his suffering, after all of his loss, after all of his perseverance, after all his encounter with God and his vindication, we read this, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the disaster that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And it goes on to speak about how God restored in abundance a Job's prior wealth. What do we make of such an ending? And how does it not undermine everything we've already been told? How does this ending contribute to the message? Well, this is not a promise that if you have faith in God, he will take all of your frowns and turn them upside down. That if you just trust God enough, if you just obey God enough, then he will reward you beyond your imagination. To read Job in this way removes the book from its place within the larger drama of redemption. That drama that began with God's promise that in Genesis 3.15, that he would put enmity between the uh, serpent and the woman and the seed of the serpent and the seed of the w- woman. And that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and triumph. And the seed of the woman would triumph over the seed of the serpent. Nevertheless, in that triumph, he would bear a wound, a bruise on his own heel. Let me conclude with this. That six times... In the book of Job, God refers to Job, not as Job, but my servant Job. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? In Job, we're not, just, we're not given just a model of Christian perseverance in the faith of su- face of suffering and steadfastness in the face of hardship, but we see in Job a type of Christ the servant who suffers unjustly and whose faithfulness to God in and through unspeakable suffering vindicates God and silences the accusations of the devil and qualifies him to be the mediator for sinners and results in him being glorified. That's what we see at the conclusion of Job. The glory of Job is a picture of the glory of Christ. It is a glory that is bestowed on the servant of the Lord who, though he is righteous, endures unspeakable suffering with steadfastness and is in turn rewarded with riches and glory for his faithfulness. In his commentary on Job, the author John Hartley points out numerous parallels between Job and the suffering servant of Isaiah. Uh, Both, for example, are despised. Job says, even the young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. You'll remember in Isaiah, we read of the servant of the Lord that the servant is as one from whom men hide their faces, as he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Both Job And the suffering servant are humiliated. They're mocked. They're spat upon. Job says, they abhor me. They uh, they keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me. In Isaiah 50, verse 6, the servant of the Lord declares, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. He goes on, he says, I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. Both are deserted by family and closest friends. Job says, he has put my brothers far from me. Those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservant count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. Isaiah 53.3, the prophet writes that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Both are regarded as, regarded as one who is smitten by God. Job says in 1921, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Isaiah 53, 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him 
stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. Though neither has committed violence or have spoken deceitful words, nevertheless they suffer. Remember Isaiah 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit found in his mouth. So too Job declares, my face is red with weeping and on my eyelids is deep darkness, although there is no violence in my hands. Both rest their case with God. Job says, behold, even now my witness is in heaven and he who testifies for me is on high. Jesus says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Without question, Job is a type of Christ. Job is a type of Christ. Job suffered though he was innocent. Job was wrongly accused by his friends and neighbors. And yet it was Job's obedience represented by his integrity and his faith that qualifies him to be an intercessor for his three faithless friends. He offers prayers on their their behalf. He offers sacrifices for them. And the Lord accepts Job's mediation. Job's prayer for his friend's folly makes them acceptable in the sight of Yahweh. And so the great wealth that Job receives at the end, don't make the mistake of seeing this as some perverse health and wealth gospel. What we have here is a picture of the glory of Christ. The wealth that Job receives is a picture of God who is able to restore unto his people all that is lost to them in this life. It's a picture of resurrection life. Job never knows why he suffered so terribly. Don't ever forget that. He never knows, but he is comforted with the knowledge that God does. And there's a call here, therefore, Christian. There's a call here to take comfort in God's goodness, God's sovereignty, and yes, even in God's inscrutable wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for a tour de force through Job. I don't think I've gotten that much out of Job in 40 minutes in my life, so thank you very, very much. Uh, Delighted to be back with you here again. My name is David Garner. I am a professor of systematic theology at Westminster, also our academic dean and vice president of global ministries, Um, and I read books in my spare time. It is a great joy to have this partnership with you here in Middle Tennessee, and in particular here at Nashville, and then even more particularly here at Covenant Presbyterian Church. Many thanks to you who are on session here, who have continued to invite us to be a part of this uh, community of faith and to do seminary on Saturday, which began actually back in 2011. So we've been at this for uh, many years. We do this twice a year. And with a view towards that, mark your calendars. The first weekend in May of 2020, I believe that's May the 2nd. Is that right? All right. May 2nd, 2020, we will have SOS again here and be doing a focus on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Dr. David Brionis and I will be here again, uh, Lord willing, in May. So we're looking forward to that as well. You can already register. It's available for registration. So you can uh, already sign up during Stephen's next session. All right. No, don't do it then. Um, All right. I also want to acknowledge a few other folks who have not yet been acknowledged. I would like to ask all of you who are on the Westminster Nashville Advisory Board, if you would stand, please. Anybody who is a member of that, Look around the room. These folks are part of the Nashville Advisory Board, and there's a few others who are not with us as well, but Matt Bradley here in the back and David Filson, there you are, up here, they are our co-chairs of the Nashville Advisory Board and uh, so grateful for the leadership of this team, and uh, many of you are actually here because of Rachel Brooks and her diligence. Um, Let's hear it for Rachel as well. 
one of the blessings that has grown out of this years-long partnership is through the leadership of Charles McGowan. Most of you in this room knew Alice as well, or at least of Alice, but Charles is on our board at Westminster Theological Seminary, and just a few years ago, we had an initiative to begin the Charles and Alice McGowan Scholarship. And we, in that time frame, actually raised about $600,000 for student scholarships, full scholarships at Westminster Theological Seminary. Well, one of those scholar award winners is here, and he is actually from this church. And so I'm going to welcome Matt Bonner. Where are you, Matt? There you are in the back. You have to come to the front. All right, let's see how we do here. Um, Matt is going to give you just a brief testimony about his first year at Westminster Theological Seminary. I want you to know he is in one of my classes, and he does stay awake, all right? So um, very glad to have you with us, Matt. Would you just share briefly? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garner. Um, as you'll see in a moment, it's impossible to, uh, to get drowsy in Dr. Garner's class, so <laughs> not a possibility. Um, I'm at Westminster because I started here at seminar on Saturday. I am a direct product of this seminar. Yeah, and so I thank God for that. And <laughs> so I wouldn't be there if I wasn't here first. And I think it started in 2014 at the eschatology seminar. And so it's just a tremendous gratitude for me to stand here and say that so many times I came to these, and it was awesome. And now i got to tell you this. My wife <laughs> chides me that last year, uh, as we were preparing our anniversary trip for our 15th anniversary, October 11th, uh, we had to change the dates because Seminar on Saturday was falling on the weekend that we were planning to be away for our anniversary. And it's especially so because I'm a stickler for celebrating our anniversary on the date. But we had to move it because we had to be here to hear about the holiness of God <laughs> last year. So uh, I will be forever chided about that. My experience so far at Westminster has been tremendous. I've only been through two-thirds of my first semester as a first year, uh, but I'm learning a tremendous amount, and it's an honor to be walking in the places where so many faithful men and women have walked over the years, 90 years now. It's tremendous. It's a surreal experience, and I thank God every day that I'm there. The professors are passionate and pastoral. We start every class with a prayer from the professor or a great hymn sung uh, with great gusto. We have chapel every Wednesday where the campus closes down, the library closes, there are no classes. We come together as a community to worship God. And I hear from my pastors as they exposit the word of God and they preach the word of God in worship. And it's every Wednesday. And it's a true blessing to do that. So the, the professors are pastoral. They're passionate. I could go on and on about them. In Dr. Garner's class, one of my classmates, Gloria from Korea, brilliant student, went up to her after, was walking out of the class afterwards, she's sitting there, sitting there with this, this stunned look on her face. And I said, what is it? And she said, this is not work. This is not even class. This is like church. And it's just a privilege to sit there week after week, day after day. Can you imagine doing this every day for five days a week? It is a privilege and an honor. The students, oh my gosh. World-renowned. If you didn't know that Westminster was world-renowned, let me tell you, it's world-renowned. I've met students from Korea, from Taiwan, from New Zealand, from China, from Great Britain, all over Africa. People who bring their families. People who have sacrificed a tremendous amount. My friend Vicky, who I was in Hebrew with, from China, has a tracking beaten on her, on her, beaten, or beacon on her phone from her government. Her government's tracking her, yet she's still at Westminster. I could tell you so many stories. My friend Charles, who's from Scotland, who's 64 years old. His wife died a year ago. He said, this is 35 years in the making. 
I'm here. Man, it is awesome to be around people like that. So I'm enriched by my professors, by the fellow students that are around me from all around who are paying the price to sit next to people from Korea learning Hebrew and English as a second language. I have no excuse to fail Hebrew because these people are going through a grueling experience I can't even imagine. So it's just a tremendous experience for the professors, the students, the learning environment. I'm learning so much about just how to be a man of God in the service of God. And I'm tremendously excited for the future. So if any of you here has any inkling whatsoever to think about seminary, please don't think that it's just a distant dream, just a, dis- just a dis- possibility. I can remember sitting right over here talking to Matt Bradley a few years ago and said, man, is it possible for someone like me in my 40s, I have three young kids, no way, no way, but it is possible, and it can happen, and there's no better place than Westminster. So I encourage you, if, if, if you have any inkling whatsoever, please talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you. It's, it's a thrill. So thanks for coming today. Thanks for giving me a moment to share my experience. I'd love to share with you. If you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you about it. So thank you. We are so proud of you, Matt Bonner. You have no idea. Hey, listen, as Dave said, uh, we have good news for you. Next seminar on Saturday, May 2nd, it's already open for registration. And if you go ahead and do it now, you don't just get the early bird, right? You get the, su- it's like an egg. You, you're in the egg. If you go ahead and register now, you get the super early bird special for $15. $15, you can go ahead and sign up for our next SOS, which is going to be entitled Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, The Ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Christian Life. You simply don't want to miss uh, the next one. You really don't. Hey, a couple of quick items here before we transition into Steve's next talk. Uh, We really owe uh, a great debt of gratitude to Rachel Brooks. She has worked so hard. Uh, You know, y'all know, y'all know and love Rachel, right? She has just worked so hard. And so uh, could we just hear it for Rachel? And Rachel, would you come up here just a quick second? The, the Westminster board here in Nashville wants to give you a little gift here. So this is a nice little tote with, uh, you know, you can put stuff in there. You can put, you can go, all the things, all the, all the, things. Things. All the things go in there. So that's from us to you. Thank you. You worked so hard. Let's hear it for her again. And hey, quick question. Quick question. What, you're saying something to me, baby? You're trying to be incognito. Behind, oh, great, thank you, got it, thank you. All right, so, listen, let me ask you, does anybody have a birthday today? Does anybody have a birthday today? Does anybody have a birthday yesterday? Does anybody have a birthday two days ago? Let me ask you this, did anybody have a birthday this past week? Oh, my goodness, you had a birthday this past week. Tell me your name. Jordan. Jordan, can we sing happy birthday to Jordan? Yes. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jordan, happy birthday to you, Jordan, happy birthday. Now you can see how nice and cozy, that is fantastic. Hey, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, The Nashville Board got some quick business we need to do. Uh, Just for the Nashville Board people, y'all just bear with us. I'd like to entertain a motion that we receive Allison Burr as our newest board member. Is anyone willing to move that? Is there a second? All in favor, would you stand? All right, Allison, you're in. Come here, girl. Woo-woo-woo-woo-woo. And a little gift for you to welcome you onto the Nashville Board of WTS. That's fantastic. All right, Steve, you're up next, man. I don't know how you follow that, but uh, you can try. Come on. All right. Okay. Um, Last one from me this morning. Thank you to you all. Your attentiveness. and. we're going to look at, at uh, Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, and to our entrance into Ecclesiastes is going to come uh, from two, two portions of the, of the book. 
I want to read to you first from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 to 15. And these two portions are going to serve as sort of our, our entree into the, into the book. So hear now the word of God. Ecclesiastes 1, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 to 3. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And then over to chapter 3, starting at verse 9, we read, What gain? What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Oscar Wilde once said that the well-bred contradict other people but the wise contradict themselves. Uh, now, if Oscar Wilde is right, which he rarely is, uh, the speaker of the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the wisest people to ever live. Because what we have here in the opening verses is what is considered to be, by many, to be one of the most difficult and mysterious books in the entire Bible. And perhaps chief among the many difficulties and challenges presented by Ecclesiastes are the numerous contradictions. Uh, in chapter 2, the preacher declares work to be sorrow. He says My work is, his work is a vexation. And then in the very next chapter, the preacher says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And it is precisely this habit of self-contradiction that caused some of the early rabbis to question whether or not the book of Ecclesiastes should be included in the Bible. Was it safe for public consumption? Yet we have a book before us, which with all of its difficulties and obscurities and enigmas comes to us as the very word of God. It comes to us for our edification, for our training in righteousness. In fact, the book concludes with a notice that besides being wise, the preacher taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs. And what we learn from this is that Ecclesiastes is for the people. It's not for the philosophers or the intellectuals or sort of the, moral, the morally elite but it's for all people. It's wisdom for the people. So, and it's wisdom for people, as we'll see, for people who live in a world that's full of contradictions. That really is the preacher's goal. Here we have reflections of a sage who goes by the name of the preacher. On the basis of the opening verse in which he's referred to as the son of David, king in Jerusalem, as well as the opening vignette, many have assumed that the reflections here are the reflections of King Solomon. However, there are other parts of the book that seem to indicate that the sage is adopting this, a sort of perspective or persona of Solomon to make a point, only to shed the Solomonic guise in order to consider life from other perspectives throughout the book. The fact of the matter is that the preacher seems intent upon hiding his identity, whether it's Solomon or not. He's hiding his identity behind his message. 
so that it will be his message uh, that, that is left with the people. And so it's to his message that we turn uh, this morning, and it's this message that I believe is summarized, is summarized for us in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, when we read, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Here the preacher introduces a number of themes that he's going to consider and develop throughout the course of the book. It's like a a jazz tune that gives you the melody up front before the musicians begin to improvise on the melody throughout. So too, the preacher here in these verses condenses his message for us, identifying what I believe are the major themes of the book, right? The theme of vanity, the theme of gain, both of which are, are central to his message. However, our text concludes with another phrase that also recurs throughout the book. And it's this phrase that I think orients us to the the preacher's perspective. It's that little phrase, you heard it, under the sun. Under the sun. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Uh, Throughout the book, the preacher will remind us that what he is observing in the world occurs under the sun. As in chapter 3, verse 16, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. 4, verse 1, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. 4, 7, again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, and yet there is no end to his toil. What he is observing, he is observing as taking place under the sun. What does he mean by under the sun? Right? Under the sun as opposed to what? Over the sun? Well, it's with this little phrase that the preacher is signaling to us or reminding us that he is viewing the world from the perspective of God's common curse on mankind. The curse that we read in Genesis 3. God's response to the first man and first woman's primal act of rebellion, which he says, cursed is the ground because of you. He says, in pain, you shall eat of it all the day of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What does life look like east of Eden? How has God's curse against humankind affected how we relate to God and how we relate to the creation? How has it affected our lives? It's in this little phrase that the preacher is reminding us that where we live, our context, day in and day out, we live under the common curse. And we're looking at a world that is groaning under the weight of sin. A world that is languishing under the divine word of judgment, which creates fractures in the, very, in the created order. Now, the preacher, we see, is not an idealist. He's not a sentimentalist. Nor is he a pessimist or a cynic, as some would have us believe. I do not believe he's a pessimist or a cynic. He's a realist. He's not not describing life as it should be. He's not describing life as he wishes it would be or as even as it will be. He's describing life as it is. And the preacher's going to go on a quest. He's going to go on a quest to take an honest look at life as it is lived under the common curse which God has issued against mankind in Adam. This is the first thing I'd like to consider with you and looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, that is life under the sun. What does it look like? Uh, The philosopher uh, Thomas Hobbes once famously described life in medieval Europe as, quote, nasty, brutish, and short. And the preacher, were he alive to respond to Thomas Hobbes, I think would have said yes, and not just medieval Europe. Life at an every age, Wherever it is lived under the sun may accurately be described as nasty, brutish, and short. 
even the longest of lives. They seem to be short. What is the character of life in this, under the sun? Well, the, the, the preacher's answer to this question all right, uh, is found in this little Hebrew word that occurs over 30 times in the book. It's the word hevel. Everybody say hevel. 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 It opens the book with this declaration, hevel hevelim. This is a, a superlative. It's like we have the song of songs, the sheer hashirim. We, here we have the hevel hevelim. It's a superlative. But what is the preacher declaring here with this word? It's a word that means literally vapor. And so we're, we know that we're dealing with a metaphor here. Okay, that's helpful. But what is the metaphor suggesting? Well, the translations, like the interpretations, are legion. And suggestions have ranged from vanity, as I read to you, Meaningless, ephemeral, elusive, fleeting, incomprehensible, mysterious, nothingness, deceitful, and the list could go on. So important is this word for understanding the book of Ecclesiastes that one scholar said that you can tell how a person interprets the book of Ecclesiastes by how they translate this one word. Well, what does it mean? Well, to get at the meaning of hevel, we would do well to remember the chief principle of interpretation and translation, and that is that words derive their meaning in usage. Some of you may remember the wonderful scene in which Alice meets Humpty Dumpty in Through the Looking Glass. And <clears throat> Humpty Dumpty uses the word glory to mean a nice knockdown argument. And Alice objects. But that's not what the word glory means. And Humpty responds and says, when I use a word, Humpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, nothing less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That is all. Well, if we're going to let the preacher be the master here, let's look at how he uses the word. Consider with me Ecclesiastes 8.14. There is a vanity that takes place on earth. There are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. The preacher looks out. And what he sees are, are the righteous experiencing, who should be experiencing blessing and success, experiencing hardship and suffering and death. And he looks out and he sees the wicked thriving and prospering. Let's look at another example. Look at chapter 9, verse 11. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. Who should win the race? It's the, the quickest should win the way, race. Who should win the battle? The strongest. The preacher says, I have seen folly set in many high places and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. What the preacher describes here is not meaningless. Nor is it fleeting. Even our word vanity with the, the, the sense that this is something worthless or trivial doesn't really capture the preacher's experience here. The, sen the sense, rather, is that life is absurd. There's a certain absurd quality to life. There's a certain senseless quality to life. Perhaps you'd translate it as absurdity of absurdity. All is absurd. Where there should be a connection between cause and effect. 
right, where we would expect there to be harmony and order, what the preacher finds is chance and chaos. <clears throat> and as the preacher observes life lived in this sin-cursed world, he concludes that there is a, an absurdity at the center of human existence. And life is such that if you try to make sense of it, you will come up short. The world does not operate like it should. Chapter 316, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. Wickedness doesn't belong there. He says, and also in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I think it's tempting when we read such bold and challenging statements to, to, to recoil at the preacher's words here. Yet we need to remember what the preacher is doing is speaking truthfully about what is there. And that we too observe the same things. We too react the same way that the preacher reacts with feelings of bewilderment and despair. How often, for example, do we hear of an auto accident involving a drunk driver in which someone's wife and daughter are killed in an instant and the drunk driver walks away on a technicality. How do you make sense of that? How do you speak of that? How, or when you hear of, of, of dozens of perfectly competent individuals getting passed over for a promotion only for the position to go to an incompetent and undeserving individual. How do you make sense of that? We know of hundreds and thousands of babies being aborted every year by mothers who do not want children. And we know of hundreds of thousands of women whose greatest desire is to have children but are unable. If you're ever in doubt, about the senselessness of life lived under the sun, I would encourage you to sit down with any police officer. Just buy them a cup of coffee and ask about their day and their experience. Listen to their stories. My older brother is a police officer. And I remember early on hearing about some of the most absurd tra sort of, uh, travesties of justice. And I asked him, how is it that you can press on and not despair? And what he told me was, I take great comfort in Ecclesiastes. I take great comfort in Ecclesiastes. That there's an absurdity uh, to human life and existence. Now notice that the absurdities of life do not cause the preacher to, to doubt the existence of God or to doubt the sovereignty of God. He affirms both. We saw it in chapter three. It's one thing to say that God exists and that God is in control. But it's quite another thing to say, and therefore I understand all that he is up to. I can see why all that happens makes sense. We, like the preacher, may affirm both the existence of God and the sovereignty of God, and we should. And yet more often than not, we too are compelled to sort of stand back, aren't we, in bewilderment and say with the preacher that we just don't understand, we can't explain it. The life as we experience it can be absurd. And what we see here, therefore, is that the Bible is not unfamiliar with our experiences. It doesn't call us to deny the inconsistencies in what we observe and experience. It doesn't tell us to explain them away or call us to bury our head in the sand. The preacher calls us to tell the truth about the nature of life lived under the sun, the nature of life east of Eden. And the truth is that often the order that is expressed by traditional wisdom that says the race is to the swift and the battle is to the strong and the bread is to the wise breaks down. How do we respond to life's contradictions? I believe here in, in Ecclesiastes, the Bible gives us the words to say. Absurdity of absurdities. All is senseless. Because in this assessment, we bear witness to the truth that life under the sun is not life as it should be. It's not life as God designed it. And this brings me to my second point. It doesn't, Ecclesiastes doesn't just describe life under the sun, but it also teaches us how to live well under the sun. 
The preacher, you see, is not just an observer, right? There's nothing really more irritating is there than someone who can tell you what's wrong with everything but has no solutions, right? The preacher is a sage. He's a wise man, and he's setting himself not only to observe the world and telling the truth about the world, but also to instill wisdom, offering instruction about how to live well in a world that so often resists our ability to make sense of it. A preacher is, in effect, answering the question, how do I live in a world that is uncertain, which at times defies rational explanation? And in answer to that question, the preacher describes, in effect, two ways to live, two approaches to life, the approach of gain and the approach of gift. And the first approach is is mentioned in the opening verses when the preacher asks the rhetorical question, what does man gain? It's an important word there. What does man gain by all the toil that he toils under the sun? And the clear answer is nothing, right? What does he mean by, by man gains nothing? Well, he doesn't mean that mankind doesn't receive a paycheck for his work. That's not what he's talking about. He doesn't mean that we don't save for retirement. By gain, the preacher is referring to achieving something that is of ultimate or lasting value or permanence in this world under the sun. The preacher perceives that in the heart of every man and in the heart of every woman, there is a longing for permanence for something that lasts to be a part of something that goes on forever. That is gain. One commentator put it like this. He said, the idea of gain is that of surplus. And the question is asked from the perspective of someone who thinks of life in a particular way, as if it were raw material to be invested in and manipulated and shaped and given added value by what is done with it and marketed as a means of accruing capital. Gain for the preacher stands for the ways in which we try to gain mastery over the universe. We try to control our destinies, controlling our destinies and the future even beyond death. We do this through work, through love, through wealth, through joy, through pleasure, through success. The chief reason there is no gain to be had in this life is the reality of death, which for the preacher relativizes anything that would posture itself as gain. Death makes every experience of permanence in this life nothing more than an illusion. Mankind toils and toils. We labor, we strive, we study, we work to get ahead. And what ultimate gain do we get from it all? There may be gain temporarily, but death comes in as the great leveler. So that it reminds us that all of the stuff that we accrue in this life is not ultimately ours. That one day we will all be parted from our toys. And gain, therefore, is temporary. And for the preacher, gain that is temporary is hardly real gain. If the value of your investment portfolio skyrockets from $10,000 to $10 million tomorrow, only to plummet to $10 by the end of the week, would you say you've gained anything? What the preacher observes is that what drives so much of human striving and endeavor in this life, right? there, there, there is this relentless, exhausting drive for permanent gain. And what he observes is that strive as we might, we will never be fulfilled. We will never experience that gain that we're longing to obtain in this way. And so he says, God has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. All fulfillments of this desire are an illusion, an illusion that one day will burst like a bubble. You know, we buy our our homes, just bought our first home not long ago, and there's something satisfying about owning a home But from a a larger perspective, is it any more than renting? 
one day we will sell it to someone else. Is it that different? The preacher would say no. Traditional wisdom says get wisdom. The gain from her is better than the gain from silver or gold. But even wisdom itself is of relative value. Yes, it is better to be wise than to be a fool. As the preacher says, for the wise as for the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. Both die. A life lived striving to achieve gain is a life that will result in nothing less than a soul-crushing despair. He says, so I hated life. For what was done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and striving after the wind. However, the preacher offers us an alternative. And the alternative to living life for gain is to live life as a gift. The preacher says that the way to live well under the sun, the way to live well in a world full of contradictions is to acknowledge life, all of life, as a gift from God. And that in the midst of the frustrations, in the midst of the contradictions, there are common graces that we experience daily. And this is why I read to you from chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 13 is just one of the many places where the preacher shifts perspectives. And he views the very same reality, this time the reality of toil. He views the same reality that he just had denounced as oppressive and a vexation to the soul. And it says that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. This is God's gift to man. When our work, you see, is understood not as a means by which we're going to establish our security forever, or a means to create a name for ourselves that will never be forgotten, or to amass wealth for our posterity, When viewed in this way, our work will always be and only be a vexation which drives us further and further into a soul-crushing despair. Yet when it's seen as a gift from God, we find that there's joy to be had. There's joy to be had even in the most mundane labor as we work as unto the Lord. Viewing life as a gift leads us to thanksgiving. It leads us to glorify and enjoy God for the brief moments we have life, and for the strength we have to fulfill our work. Although the preacher's assessment of life in the sin-cursed world is, is fairly grim, what I want you to see is that, is that the message of Ecclesiastes is not one of hopelessness. Actually, the preacher really is a preacher of joy. When he says, go eat your bread in joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Our work is a gift. Our families are a gift. Our wealth is a gift. Our health is a gift. These are gifts from God and tokens of his common grace. What the preacher is is saying here then is that there is joy to be had even in a world under the curse of sin. There is pleasure. there There is laughter. This is not the joy of hedonism, life lived for the sake of pleasure. This isn't striking up a song and pouring drinks and sitting down for one more game of poker on the Titanic. This is a recognition, rather, that in the midst of the common curse, God in his infinite goodness has bestowed his common graces upon mankind. And central to his words of hope here is a summons to a new perspective on life, a perspective that approaches life not with a view toward gain, achieving some sort of lasting permanence, but rather the preacher exhorts us to live life as a gift every day as a gift from God to be received with thanksgiving and joy. So the message of Ecclesiastes is that there is no gain to be had under the sun, that through our own efforts, strength, our wealth, power, or even our wisdom, we will never satisfy that longing for permanence or that desire for eternity. 
But there is a joy to be had, a joy that comes from acknowledging God's common graces as gifts. These are gifts that are to be enjoyed with, in recognition of our Father from whom comes every good and perfect gift that we receive. But we have here ultimate, also a reminder, and it's a reminder that our ultimate hope is not in receiving God's common graces as a gift, but in receiving God's saving grace as a gift. Just as the common curse points us to an eternal curse for human sin, so too does God's common grace serve as a pointer or a suggestion that there just may be an eternal hope for sinners. This hope, however, is not known by observing the created order. You can never get to the cross of Christ by observing the created order. Because salvation of sinners doesn't accord with the nature of things, but it accords with the gracious revelation of God. In Christ, we see God's response to the absurdity of human existence. At the incarnation, God himself entered into our world characterized by senselessness and incongruities, by absurdities and confusion. Jesus experienced, didn't he, the greatest absurdity, the greatest absurdity that ever occurred under the sun, that the innocent would be pronounced guilty, that the righteous would be declared a sinner, the holy would be regarded as accursed, the impure, the clean would be regarded as unclean. In the crucifixion of the Son of God, we hear of an absurdity that defies all reason. When Jesus died that day on Calvary, we see the absurdity of injustice. We see the absurdity of the triumph of evil. We see the absurdity of the, one, the only one who should gain anything permanent, losing it all, losing everything. But we also see in the cross the absurdity of God's love for sinners. As the Apostle Paul says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, brothers and sisters of Christ, I would I would suggest to you that what we have here in the cross is a balm for every world-weary sinner. It is God's ultimate gift. It's a gift to be received by faith. It's a gift that is an expression of God's grace, not just his common grace, but his saving grace. Notice, however, that while the cross is the answer to the, pre the preacher's experience of absurdity. The cross does not solve all the preacher's questions. It doesn't give him all the answer to life, and it doesn't give you or me all of the answers to life. The cross is the answer, but it is a, not an answer that gives us the key to the mysteries and enigmas of human existence. existence. God's ways in the world continue to be mysterious. Our experience continues at times to be absurd. But what we have in Christ is God's final resolution. It's a resolution that says our experience of the common curse, the absurd life lived under the sun, has been overcome and overwhelmed by the God who has promised to make all things new. Christ doesn't just, doesn't, I should say, enable us to gain mastery over the universe, much less even our own lives. Christ has gained, Christ has conquered, Christ is now master and Lord of all, and our hope, therefore, is not in fixing life lived under the sun, but it's actually, our, our hope is actually in receiving a life beyond the sun, a kingdom that cannot be shaken because it is founded on the finished work of Christ. As we wait, as we 
hope as we struggle with the absurdities of life lived under the sun, we may do so by faith in that finished work. And so know the joys, not just of God's common graces, though we should know those joys, but know ultimately the the greatest joy of God's saving grace. Thank you. Can I conclude our time in prayer? Our Father, we are thankful for the wonderful, marvelous, and expressible grace that we have received through your Son, our Lord Christ Jesus. We thank you that in him, while we don't gain insight into every, everything that occurs under the sun in this sin-cursed world, we nevertheless may behold your answer to the curse of sin and the sorrows we endure day in and day out, uh, that in Christ you have conquered and have purposed one day to put all things under his feet. We pray that you would enable us by your spirit to live in hope, live in hope for that great day, seeking to live lives of wisdom as we honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.